Bill Anders will always mention that he was the first one to get to the moon because he was in a position whereby he was a few centimeters ahead of us as he rotated the spacecraft. <laughs> Mark Spitz, you know, I mean, first is first, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the reason is we were flying backwards and he had a bigger butt. That's the only <laughs> Whatever it takes. <laughs> but when first we finally came into the earth shine, or uh, sunshine, actually, we came out, I think we were best expressed as uh, you know, three school kids looking through a candy store window. You know, the flight plan was forgotten for a few moments. Our noses were pressed to the, the glass. And we were all looking at those ancient old craters on the far side of the moon, which, of course, as you all know, we don't see from the Earth. And, uh, and to see what, what they were and how they were, we were just 60 miles above the, uh, the moon at that time. And uh, I think that's one of the uh, great impressions I've had in the, in the first instances of actually becoming a, a satellite of, of the moon. Jim was uh, busy photographing along the flight pass through the navigation system, and I was shooting right, <laughs> left, and uh, and uh, it, we. One thing that you, f I don't think we had a light meter. The NASA had calculated what the uh, the uh, reflected light would be depending on our longitude, which depend on our time, and so I just checked the clock and I'd turn it f this or f that, and uh, and so we got a lot of good pictures of. Uh, the uh, lunar surface. As Bill said, he was doing all this with photography, and I wanted him to be studying the systems, doing this. And that. So I said, Anders, forget about those pictures. Don't worry about it. But we'll, we'll, we'll be able. And he was doing all this on the sly in the uh, sauna, <laughs> without anybody knowing about it. Right. But actually, I think that was made probably the most important evidence that we brought back was the was the photography. And Jim and Lovell, Jim and uh, Bill did it all. We were coming around on this third revolution and I was taking pictures over here. Uh, Jim was asleep. I, I'm not even sure what he was doing. And uh, I think Frank yelled out, look, or something. And uh, here was this gorgeous thing coming up over the, uh, the lunar horizon, the back side of the moon, much rougher than the front side of the moon. And so, boy, there was a mad scramble for cameras. Uh, each guy had one, started firing off. I was lucky because I had one with a long lens and color film. And uh, I just kept snapping and turning the f-stop. And uh, each, other, each of the guys took uh, the same view but different size lenses. And it just so happened that NASA picked the one I took as the uh, iconic Earthrise picture. But frankly, even though they both claimed they took it, uh, they know who did, but I consider it kind of a crew picture. Uh, just, We've just, talked just, about being in orbit now, and one of the more exciting parts of the, of the mission from my standpoint was lighting the rocket to get us home, otherwise we'd still be there. And on the 10th revolution, behind the moon, we lit the, the rocket what, for about four or five minutes. It worked perfectly, and we started home, and go ahead, James. Well, I have to get into detail here because uh, the, we're in the far side of the moon and we have to light this engine, otherwise we'll be captured uh, permanently as a satellite of the moon. And so my job was to actually do the work through the computer. And we had a, 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 a signal, or, or actually numbers on the computer, that got down to five seconds before it should be lit. And uh, it said something like, do you really want to make this maneuver? This gave you a little bit of a chance to say, hey, I don't want to do this, you know, to think about it. And so I hesitated with my finger, and Borman says, push the button, push the button. <laughs> anyway, uh, my recollection is we're coming back 35,000 feet a second, uh, way over any world speed record that had been set before, uh, seven miles a second, basically. And um, I, I remarked, to, uh, to Frank or Jim and said, gee, it looks like, uh, you know, we're, are we getting sunrise? Or no, are we, are we getting entry? And they said, oh, no, this is sunrise. And I said, well, if this is sunrise, we're going right into the sun. And this, it just got brighter and brighter and brighter. And pretty soon I felt like, uh, like a bug that was somehow gotten inside a blowtorch flame watching this torch go. And uh, as the G's build up, every now and then it looked like a big chunk would come flying off the uh, heat shield. Well, when you see the uh, meteors uh, coming in, you know, they light up very bright, but really they're just tiny little pebbles, and they ionize and make a big flash. I didn't think about that at the time, and I could just feel the heat coming through uh, the spacecraft. Uh, and then we got down lower. Uh, we came in at night, first night reentry. 
Uh, and the, it got dark, and at, what, at 50,000 feet or so, the, uh, the droves fired, uh, and we, we could feel a jerk. That was very reassuring. And then at, what, 18,000 or something, the uh, main chutes came out, 12,000, 12, uh, but we couldn't see them, and, and I think we needed two to make it, you know. Yeah. And uh, so it all seemed like one jerk, and I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, three shoots and one pull, that's not too good. But uh, our Jim and Frank checked our vertical velocity seemed to be in orbit. But when we hit, it was the biggest belly buster I've ever been on. And uh, one of Frank's jobs was to flick a switch that would blow off uh, the parachutes. But, you know, we hit so hard it just ripped his hand from the switch. And by the time he could recover, the chutes had pulled down wind and this thing was floating upside down. So I thought here we were conquering heroes from the moon, hanging from our straps and all the trash that was in the spacecraft that had collected on the floor when we were coming in now was raining down on our face. So it was, uh, that's one of my big recollections. Well, we came in uh, uh, because we actually why we hit so hard, the, the spacecraft was hanging from the parachutes at an angle. And the idea was that the the edge of the spacecraft would slice into the water and sort of not make it a little bit easier for the landing. Well, it so happened that we were swinging on the uh, shrouds of the uh, of the uh, parachutes, and also the wave action was such that they both matched so that we hit both things flat, and that's what caused the uh, 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 caused the the, the sudden uh, you know hitting the water. And of course, the, the parachutes then pulled us over to what is known as a stable two, which meant that we were hanging upside down just on our straps, which is sort of an unusual way. And so Frank had to throw another switch uh, that inflated about three balloons that slowly made us rotate up. And all this motion, of course, with Frank was another little disconcerting thing. And he couldn't wait to get out of that spacecraft to get back on that ship. I think that that the three of us were very, very fortunate Americans. 400,000 people put that thing together, 400,000 Americans. Uh, several died in it, uh, in the fire and in airplane crashes. Uh, I, I felt very, very, very blessed to be with Jim and Bill because it was, there was a wonder, wonderful camaraderie there. It's hard to tell. I, I know. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still mad about you doing that in the sauna, but nevertheless. <laughs> Uh, it was a, it was a remarkable feeling, and, and I, I can remember as I, we stepped out on the carrier with that fresh ocean breeze and the flag flying there and the sailors all standing around. It was a feeling to me of overwhelming sense of gratitude for what we had been part of. As soon as we got down, at least to, in my feelings, uh, I didn't realize exactly what we had accomplished. I knew that we accomplished a successful first flight to the moon, but I didn't know the significance of it uh, for the United States and for the world of what, what had happened. It, it takes time for these things to sink in. It takes a little bit of history and aging to say, hey, really what happened? How does this affect, you know, uh, our view uh, of the country? Especially, as Martin had mentioned, uh, 1968 was a very poor year in this country, and then we suddenly ended that year on a positive note, doing something you know, positive for the country that everybody could take pride in. And in a sense, uh, had great feelings about the accomplishment, but I frankly felt a little guilty because all of us had uh, comrades and colleagues doing uh, things that I thought were a lot more dangerous. Uh, fighting in Vietnam, a uh, lot of colleagues shot down, put in prison, El Dorado Canyon, raid on Libya. Uh, frankly, I think Apollo 8 was probably a lot safer, and uh, we were lucky to be part of it, as Frank said. No, I, did too. I, I agree with you. And, you know, you stop thinking, look at, the, at John Glenn. What, 69 missions in World War II and there's so many missions in, in Korea, and uh, you know, if I hadn't been in, if I hadn't been in Apollo, I'd have, I would have wanted been in Vietnam, yeah. but we weren't, and and we sort of got all the adulation and all the success and all the plaudits, and there were so many people that were trying to serve this country under much more difficult circumstances. So I felt very humble and very grateful. Yeah.